Good afternoon. I want to welcome all of you to the Old Pine Street Presbyterian Church. My name is Jason Ferris. I'm one of the ministers here, and we're really delighted uh, that you took time today to come to this lecture. We're delighted to be having this lecture. The occasion of this event is that it's the 250th anniversary of the Continental Congress, which apparently ended on October 26th, 1774. So yesterday was the 250th anniversary of the ending of that important gathering of representatives from the colonies. And today we're gonna to get to hear a lecture from Mark Knoll about what the Presbyterians were up to uh, at that point in time. Uh, I'm just gonna get right now, just go over a couple of uh, sort of housekeeping things. There are bathrooms downstairs. Uh, there is a reception after the service that you are all welcome to join and there will be uh, books for sale at that reception. One of the books is described in this insert in your bulletin. Uh, I encourage you to look through that. And am I forgetting anything at this point? Yeah? Turn off, thank you very much. Please turn your cell phones to silent or off. <laughs> anything else I should mention? All right, well then I would like to invite Heath Carter to introduce Professor Knoll. Greetings from Princeton Seminary where I teach. It's lovely to be here at Old Pine in Philadelphia and uh, to be a part of today's event. Um, it's my privilege and delight to introduce Dr. Mark Knoll, one of the world's leading church historians to you. Um, Dr. Knoll recently retired as the Francis A. McEnany Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame, having previously served as Professor of History and Theological Studies at Wheaton College. He is the author and editor of many, many books. Uh, most recently, some of the more recent titles include C.S. Lewis in America, published by IVP in 2023, America's Book, The Rise and Decline of a Bible Civilization, 1794 to 1911, published by Oxford in 2022. Evangelicals, Who They Have Been, Are Now, and Could Be, with George Marsden and David Bebbington, Erdman's 2019. In the Beginning Was the Word, The Bible and American Public Life, Oxford 2015. From Every Tribe and Nation, A Historian's Discovery of the Global Christian Story, Baker Academic 2014, and Jesus Christ and the Life of the Mind, Erdman's 2011. He's also served on the editorial boards for Books and Culture and Christian History, and is a co-editor uh, of the Library of Religious Biography for William B. Erdman's Publishing Company. In 2006, Dr. Knoll received the National Endowment for the Humanities Medal at the White House. He currently lives in Wheaton, Illinois with his wife, Maggie, he is truly an expert on this subject. He will uh, just excited for the lecture and also for the conversation afterwards. I'll ask a couple of questions to get that kick started and then we'll open it up to you for your questions. Uh, but without further ado, please welcome Dr. Mark Knoll. Well, I'm grateful for that very kind introduction. And it is indeed a special privilege to be in Philadelphia 250 years and a few weeks after the first meeting of the Continental Congress convened in this city. It's also an added privilege to be presenting this talk at the Old Pine Presbyterian Church where George Duffield, its pastor in those faraway days, led the congregation in such robust support of independence that others came to call this church the Church of the Patriots. I'm also pleased that the occasion has let me review research that I began more than 50 years ago on the subject of Christian believers in the American Revolution, but also allowed me to read really important recent books and articles on the specific history of Presbyterians that have augmented what I already knew, but then also made me change my mind about what I thought I already knew. In this talk, I'm trying to draw together three different ways of approaching our subject. There is first what could be called the heroic picture in which later Presbyterians have depicted their predecessors as the crucial driving force that secured ind American independence, the primary source of thinking behind the U.S. Constitution, and the ecclesiastical leader in setting the nation on its course under God toward liberty and justice for all. 
The second strand, in strong contrast, includes some earlier accounts, but even more recent critical attention, in which Presbyterians appear as provocateurs, exchanging their traditional theology for secular propaganda and as hypocrites for accusing Britain of tyrannizing the colonies because of a two-penny tax on tea, while they supported the real tyranny of enslavement of Africans. The third strand is the work of patient scholars who have carried out thorough, wide-ranging research and who have carefully sifted knotty questions about the relationship among Christian faith, the churches, the revolution, and the Constitution. Scholarship, of course, is always uh, written from the angle of the scholar, so there's nothing like purely objective scholarship. But this strand differs from the other two by the effort to, to enlist as much research as possible for the most carefully considered conclusions as possible. And as we go along today, the, the outline that was handed out to you may help you because there'll be some qu uh, quotations. And if you get feel completely lost by what I'm saying, you can look on the page and maybe find what I'm trying to do. So here's the four questions for today. How patriotic were the Presbyterians? What was Christian and what was not in Presbyterian support for the revolution? How Presbyterian was the Constitution? And what about Presbyterians and slavery? In attempting answers, I will be referring frequently to the most visible American Presbyterian leader of the era. In 1768, John Witherspoon, whose portrait is on the front page of your outline, came from Scotland to become president of the College of New Jersey at Princeton. His leadership maintained Princeton's reputation as the main training center for Presbyterian clergy, but also heightened his reputation as a leader in civic life. In July 1776, he was the only clergyman to sign the Declaration of Independence. And after the war, he contributed to the reorganization of Presbyterians into the General Assembly, from which most American Presbyterians today trace their descent. But first, a quick word of orientation. You have on, I think it's the third page of your outline, some of the crucial dates for the nation's founding and for the Presbyterians, as well as a table enumerating the number of local congregations over the course of the 18th century. We can come back for details later, but for the revolution, it's important to note how rapidly colonial enthusiasm for the British Empire at the end of the French and Indian War deteriorated into suspicion of parliament, and then how quickly that suspicion moved to outright conflict. For the Presbyterians, the key thing to note is the rapid growth at the, of the denomination at mid-century, fueled by Scottish and Scotch-Irish immigration that made the Presbyterians the most widely distributed denomination in the colonies. It's also intriguing to note that negotiations leading to the U.S. Constitution and to the creation of the Presbyterian General Assembly took place at the same time in Philadelphia, the same city, with the Constitution showing at least some influence from the reform thinking of the Presbyterians and the Presbyterians adopting the traditional Westminster standards after they amended the Westminster Confession of Faith to bring it in line with America's new convictions about the separation of church and state. So the first question, how patriotic were the Presbyterians? It's well documented that on several occasions, George III described the American revolt as a Presbyterian war. But since the king regularly referred to all non-Anglicans as Presbyterians, and since he and his advisors could never tell the difference between Presbyterians and the New England Congregationalists who most aggressively supported the revolution, the king's testimony was not too reliable. Yet observers on the ground said just about the same thing. During the Stamp Act crisis, Joseph Galloway, a leading Presbyter a Pennsylvania politician who later became a loyalist, claimed that the agitation against Parliament was led by Congregationalists, Presbyterians, and smugglers. In the months after the promulgation of the Declaration of Independence, an Englishman by the name of Nicholas Creswell sent this report back to the home country. He wrote, 
The Presbyterian clergy are particularly active in supporting the measures of Congress from the rostrum, gaining proselytes, persecuting the unbelievers, preaching up the righteousness of their cause, and persuading the unthinking populace of the infallibility of success. Some of the religious rascals assert that the Lord will send his angels to assist the injured Americans. They gain great converts, great numbers of converts, and I am convinced if they establish their independence, that Presbyterianism will become the established religion on the continent. More succinct was one of the mercenaries from Hesse in Germany who had been recruited to support the British Army. Call this Valor whatever name you may, only it's not an American rebellion. It is nothing more or less than an Irish Scots Presbyterian rebellion. As the war went on, defenders of Parliament and the Crown did exactly what the Patriots were doing by publishing learned tracts, preaching Bible-based sermons, and also producing a great deal of simple propaganda. One of the most skillful Loyalist publishers was Jonathan Odell, who brought out a lengthy poem lampooning several Patriot leaders. One of his targets, a mockery, was George Duffield and the Old Pine Congregation. A saint of old, as learned monks have said, preached to the fish. The fish his voice obeyed. The same good man convened the grunting herd, who bowed obedient to his powerful word. Odell waxed even more vituperative about the president of Princeton, who was playing a prominent role in rallying Americans for the cause and with his service in the Continental Congress. Member of Congress, we must hail him next. Came out of Babylon was now his text. I've known him seek the dungeon dark as night, imprisoned Tories to convert or fright. Whilst to myself I've hummed a dismal tune, I'd rather be a dog than Witherspoon. <laughs> Scorn that the loyalists heaped on John Witherspoon in the College of New Jersey accurately suggested the importance of that institution. It was both the Presbyterians' most vi visible public institution and a much noted promoter of the Patriot cause. During the years before the war, there were so many student declamations attacking Parliament and so many public displays celebrating acts of colonial resistance <clears throat> that some observers called it a seminary of sedition. Such observations turned out to be prophetic. <clears throat> From Witherspoon's arrival in 1768 until the end of the war in 1783, 355 young men enrolled at the college. Of that number, Princeton historians have found only five who could be described as loyalists. Considered more generally, Presbyterians showed up as leaders in almost every patriot activity. Of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, 12 were Presbyterians. And of those 12, to indicate one of the factors fueling Presbyterian patriotism, three were born in Northern Ireland, and two, including Witherspoon, came from Scotland. Two of the signers were graduates of the College of New Jersey. Richard Stockton, whose stately home in Princeton, Morven, is now a well-curated museum, was a member of the college's first graduating class in 1748. Benjamin Rush of Philadelphia, was the colony's most famous physician and was indeterminate in his denominational affiliation, but always closely associated with the Presbyterians. Among less, fam less famous individuals, the conditions that had uh, prompted emigration from Ireland predisposed those recent re uh, immigrants to stand with the Patriots. Presbyterians had been moving from Scotland to the north of Ireland since the days of Oliver Cromwell in the mid-16th centuries. But while, but while Britain treated those Presbyterians less harshly than Ireland's Catholics, Northern Ireland Presbyterians remained second-class citizens with limited rights when compared to the favors bestowed upon the Church of Ireland. Only when Irish Presbyterians remained loyal to Britain during the Irish Rebellion of 1798 would Presbyterians in Ireland receive better treatment. That old world discrimination predisposed the Scotch-Irish to favor independence in the New World. 
Yet, as with other Christian groups, there were also some Presbyterians who rejected the revolution and remained loyal to Great Britain. In North Carolina, the surge of Scottish and Scotch-Irish immigration at mid-century had peopled the western part of the state with newcomers who resented the high-handed actions of the colony's elite on the East Coast. This resentment led to what was called a regulator movement and armed resistance to those elites. When conflict with Britain broke out, the regulators, many of them Presbyterians, reacted negatively when the colony's elite leadership joined the rebellion, following the maximum, maxim, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, some of the Presbyterian regulators remained loyal to the crown. And I think I read uh, just fairly recently before coming out to Philadelphia that George Duffield may have been commissioned by either the, the Senate of New York and New Jersey or the local Presbytery to travel to North Carolina and to persuade some of his fellow Presbyterians to join the Patriot cause. There were also a few Presbyterians who, while joining other Americans and protesting Parliament's actions, nonetheless viewed separation from Britain as a step too far. One of these figures was John Joachim, or Joachim Zubli, a Swiss-born minister of the Independent Presbyterian Church in Savannah, Georgia. Zubli was actually a delegate to the Second Continental Congress in 1775, but who, upon returning to Georgia, repudiated the move toward independence and later published newspaper articles condemning independence as a violation of the Bible and international law. A layman from New York, William Smith, would go into exile and be then become a respected judge in Canada. When questioned by New York patriots, he replied, I said that I considered myself a subject of King George III and a member of the old or British government that I never thought that separation was justifiable, that resistance to government could never be innocent unless there was great op oppression and revolution practicable and the remedy sure, that the evils brought on by opposition being great, there ought to be a moral certainty of their being less than those which were induced. Individuals like Zubli or Smith were, however, the exceptions. On the question of where Presbyterians stood during the Revolutionary War, there is wide agreement from whatever angle. Throughout the colonies, the Patriots could count on the Presbyterians, leaders, and laity alike. Two, what was Christian and what was not in Presbyterian support of the Revolution? For the next two questions, it's important to proceed carefully since there are many claims by partisans that the Presbyterians' classical reform theology provided the most important thing behind the entire movement from resistance to rebellion to the Constitution, and many other claims that they did so by selling out to the secular thinking of the 18th century. So on these questions, I'm going to pretend to be a Hegelian setting out first a thesis of primary Presbyterian credit for the American national experiment, and then the antithesis of Presbyterian accommodation to the era's conventional politics. The synthesis will come partly, come partly from my own study, but even more from the most widely researched and carefully argued historical accounts. And in the last page of the handout, there's a list of further uh, reading, and of those books and articles, the two that I think are the best are the early study in 1947 by Leonard Trinterud, and then uh, the excellent book in 2017 by Gideon Mailer, Jonathan Witherspoon's American Revolution. So first, on what was Christian and what was not Christian in the support of the revolution, the thesis. Following the first Protestants, especially John Calvin, the Reformed tradition has always held that believers owed honor and obedience to their rulers, up to a point and most of the time. The key scriptural passage has been Romans chapter 13, where the Apostle Paul taught that the higher powers were ordained by God. But Reformed thinkers have also believed that rulers could be resisted if, as 
Romans says they become a terror to good works. In a famous passage from his Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin even affirmed that as if lawfully installed lesser magistrates did not restrain the fierce licentiousness of their rulers, they were guilty of nefarious perfidy. In his commentary on the book of Daniel, Calvin went further. For earthly princes lay aside their power when they rise up against God. We ought utterly to defy them rather than to obey them. This principle, respecting and honoring rulers in ordinary times, but resisting when they become unbearably wicked, was put to use many times before John Locke and others formulated modern political theories. The principle guided John Knox when he confronted Mary, Queen of Scots in the 1560s, and the Huguenots in their struggle against Louis XIV in the 17th century France. The same principle led Scottish Presbyterians and English Puritans when they revolted against England's King Charles I. The same was at work in the late 17th century when Covenanters in Scotland and Congregationalists in the American colonies resisted efforts from England to dictate their religious and political affairs. Thus, when colonial Presbyterians protested against the Stamp Act and then joined to support the War for Independence, they were following a well-established path laid out by a consistent reformed interpretation of the Bible. A good example of that reliance on traditional reformed theology was the Fast Day Sermon that John Witherspoon preached in Princeton May 17, 1776, eight weeks before he signed the Declaration of Independence. His exposition of Psalm 76, verse 10, was entitled, The Dominion of Providence Over the Passions of Men. The sermon did eventually get around to explaining why Witherspoon thought God's providence favored the Patriot cause, but only after an extensive reformed explanation of providence and an even more extensive expo exposition of reformed teaching on the reality of original sin. When the sermon was published, Witherspoon even added a footnote de detailing his objections to the deism that peeped through Tom Paine's celebrated call to arms common sense and that had been published earlier in that fateful year, 1776. In some, when Presbyterians threw their support behind the revolution, they did so by drawing on a long tradition of Calvinist teaching about life in the world and the nature of political existence under God. Antithesis. From at least 1967 and the publication of Bernard Balin's influential book, The Origin of the American Revolution, it has been clear that the flame for independence was sparked by ideology from the 1680s justifying resistance to efforts by England's Catholic monarch, James II, to restrain Parliament and reinstitute his Catholic faith. Known that time as Whig, or anti-Tory, or anti-High Church, this flame grew more intense in the first half of the 18th century as British country voices railed in apocalyptic terms against what they viewed as the corrupt, conspiratorial, and power-mad court, then nominating English political life. Although many scholars have noted that this powerful point of view, which has been called real Whig, as just opposed to the nominal Whig, but real Whig ideology, did borrow something from reformed resistance theory, they have concluded that such borrowing was minimal compared to the influence of contemporary thinking responding to contemporary crises. Some historians have even pointed out that the fear of Parliament's conspiratorial tyranny owed a great deal to deist thought and specifically the rejection of Christian theology concerning original sin. If humans and not God have the power to determine their own destiny and do not need the intervening grace of Christ to atone for sin, then problems in the political realm must arise from human actions. When there is any kind of crisis or suspicion of evil, 
There must be a human cause, even if that cause is hidden. Keen minds could figure out the hidden cause of public vice by ferreting out how evil men abuse power to corrupt public life and tyrannize the population. This kind of thinking, which focuses on humans and not God, explains why colonists panicked in the mid-1760s when Parliament proposed a tax to raise money against the war debt Britain had accumulated defending the colonies against the French and their Indian allies. After the uproar, Parliament backed down and admitted it had made a mistake. But the real Whigs in Britain and America observed that the tax was not onerous, but it was imposed with no representation from the colonies. They were convinced that the tax was the first step in Parliament's intention to dictate absolutely to the colonies in all cases whatsoever, which was a quotation. And that kind of unchecked power could only foster vice. It could only lead to corruption and it could only end in the obliteration of the colony's traditional British liberty. Consider John Witherspoon. When he preached his sermon on the dominion of providence over the passions of men, he added a letter to Scottish immigrants urging them to join the American cause. Of course, the sermon has some reformed theology, but the letter, by contrast, has almost no theology. Instead, it amounted to a primer in real Whig ideology explained in the vocabulary of that ideology. Witherspoon appealed to the great principle of universal liberty. He insisted on British liberty and our ancient rights. He feared absolute unconditional submission and tyranny. He drew pertinent examples from Roman history and not from the Bible. And he concentrated not on anything spiritual, but on how the conflict would damage trade and colonial prosperity. From this letter, it is clear that for Witherspoon and probably most American Presbyterians, traditional Reformed theology was mostly a smokescreen, hiding their deeper commitment to the conventional oppositional politics of the 18th century. Now for the calm synthesis. Historians who concentrate on Presbyterian reliance on traditional Reformed theology have good documentary evidence. But also, so do historians who document Presbyterian reliance on the thinking and language of 18th century real Whig thought. Only a few historians have suggested that Presbyterians in the colonies may have read John Locke and other modern thinkers as extending rather than replacing traditional reform perspectives. The book I mentioned earlier by Gideon Mailer, John Witherspoon's American Revolution, takes this broader perspective. He has detailed the substantial core of evangelical reform theology that remained in almost all that Witherspoon preached and published during the crisis, as well as many other American Presbyterians. But he also acknowledges that a certain degree of ambiguity was found in many of Witherspoon's political utterances. Were they reformed? Yes. Were they influenced by more recent political philosophy that had little patience with reform tradition? Also, yes. For Witherspoon and American Presbyterians, it was not a matter of either or, but both and. Three, how Presbyterian was the Constitution. Thesis. Of all that went into the framing of the American Constitution, Reformed and Presbyterian influences were probably the most important. In a book published in 1901, The Creed of Presbyterians, Edbert, Edbert Watson Smith, pastor of the Westminster Presbyterian Church in Greensboro, North Carolina, stated this thesis with unusual clarity. When the fathers of our republic sat down to frame a system of representative popular government, their task was not so difficult as some have imagined. They had a model to work by, Calvinism, furnished the foundational principle of the Republic. The well-nigh perfect manner in which justice, freedom, order, and all the ends of popular government are secured by the Presbyterian system of graded representative assemblies with executive, legislative, and judicial functions, all distinct, 
it all working together as component parts of a well-ordered whole. In short, Calvinism furnished the model for the immortal constitution of our republic. Later historians offered more detail. They have pointed out that the most coherent intellectual position in the American 1780s was occupied by Calvinists of one sort or another, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, the variety with the Baptists, the German and Dutch Reformed. And they've noted that eight of the 39 signers of the Constitution in 1787 were associated with Presbyterian churches at some time in their lives. And that 10 graduates of Princeton were delegates, including four that had been taught by John Witherspoon. One of these students, James Madison, has been the focus of special interest. His Virginia father sent him to Pres Princeton rather than to the College of William and Mary because of Witherspoon's reputation as a defender of colonial liberty. After he graduated in 1771, Madison remained at Princeton for a year to study Hebrew, theology, and moral philosophy with Witherspoon. Moreover, early in his public career in Virginia, Madison displayed some of the same evangelical convictions that Witherspoon promoted. By the time of the Constitutional Convention in 1787, Madison had become much more private about his personal beliefs, yet the arguments he published in favor of the Constitution in the, his famous Federalist Papers clearly revealed the influence of Witherspoon's Reform theology. Listen to what Madison wrote in Federalist Number 10. The latent causes of faction are sown in the nature of man. And then Federalist 51, where he came very close to quoting what John Calvin had written in his exposition of the book of Galatians. What is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. What is Madison's thought on the latent cause of fact, faction except a reformulation for public purposes what he had learned from Witherspoon about original sin. And what was his hope that a government could promote the well-being of citizens if factions could be balanced in a democratic republic, except a restatement of reformed confidence in government as a positive ordinance from God? As James Smiley, the longtime editor of the Journal of Presbyterian History, once summarized, Madison was giving shape to traditional reform principles that combined a frank recognition of the effect of original sin and an equally frank confidence in the God-given potential for government. More recently, Gideon Mailer has pointed out another way in which Scotland and Presbyterian history may have influenced the shape of the Constitution. For Scotland, for the Presbyterian Church as the established church in Scotland, and for Presbyterians in America, without an establishment, the general idea was confederalism, or federalism with, confederalism. That is a conviction that multiple independent levels of government or representation could legitimately exist within a single government or religious association, and that such an agreement was not a defect, but a virtue. In other words, an overarching authority, but under it, quasi-independent self-standing authorities. So it was across the Atlantic after the 1707 union between Scotland and England, the two nations shared one monarch and both were under the authority of the British Parliament, but each nation retained considerable autonomy, including in Scotland, the preservation of the Presbyterians as a national church. In America, the colonies recognized the king and parliament as their general governing authority, but also exercised a great deal of autonomy in how colony by colony they conducted their own affairs. In Scotland, Witherspoon and other more evangelical Presbyterians pushed back when the British parliament and its allies in the Scottish moderate party tried to assert par parliament's control over the selection of ministers by individual congregation and approval 
by their local presbyteries. In America, the colonies revolted when Parliament and its loyalist allies tried to assert parliamentary authority over at what had been the customary privileges of the colonies. Shift now to, American, to after American independence was won. Assisted by John Witherspoons, the Presbyterians reorganized to create an overarching authority in the General Assembly, but with considerable authority reserved for regional synods, local presbyteries, and individual congregations. In similar terms, the new United States Constitution created a general authority in the national government, but left a great deal of authority to state and local governments. Quoting Mailer again, Scottish and Presbyterian notions of jurisdictional pluralism, jurisdictional pluralism, provided a template showing how shifting layers of representation and loosely bound association, both in the confessional sphere, the churches, and in broader constitutional frameworks could work for the benefit of all concerned. In a word, reform theology and Presbyterian ecclesiology, especially with the Scottish experience of that ecclesiology, decisively shaped American constitutional government. Antithesis. Yes, there does seem to be a general parallel between some reformed ideas and the eventual shape of government under the Constitution, but are there are two problems in saying anything definite about this parallelism. The first is the absence of documentation. At the Constitutional Convention, during the very extensive public debates that followed, including the Federalist Papers, and in the years thereafter, with the implementation of the Constitution, almost none of the Constitution's main authors explain where their ideas were coming from. Moreover, the period in the late 1780s when the Constitution was written, debated, and then adopted witnessed the low point in all of United States history when it came to public expression of Christian faith. The war had devastated the churches and ruptured congregational life. There would not be a rebound of Christian adherence in the United States until another decade had passed when the Methodists, assisted by other Christian groups, propelled an extended period of Christian expansion. The leading church historian of his generation, Martin Marty, once read thoroughly the extensive public arguments for and against approving the Constitution as these arguments were developed in 1788 and 1789. What was his conclusion? God comes up often, but almost never in biblical terms. The citations of the Bible as authority is extremely rare. The second difficulty is that the rich scholarship on James Madison, but also the Constitution's framers in general, has documented a wealth of sources for their thinking. Exhaustive exploration of James Madison's reading, experiencing, and personal convictions has demonstrated his debt to Greek thinkers. He especially liked to quote Thucydides and Aristotle. Roman precedents. They reveal how carefully Madison followed John Locke and other modern authors on natural rights, social compact, and religious freedom. Madison's reflections on government and the Constitution exhibit strong parallels to expositions by David Hume, Francis Hutcheson, Adam Smith, and other leaders of the Scottish Enlightenment who were trying to liberate themselves from the influence of Presbyterians and the Westminster Confession. Gideon Mailer has himself noted that what Madison wrote about men not being angels was challenging, channel, channeling not only John Calvin, but also what David Hume had written, and that Madison had learned about Hume from studying with John Witherspoon. In a word, it's a vast overstatement to claim a particularly strong influence by Presbyterians on the American Constitution. Synthesis. In my view, a stronger case can be made for Presbyterian influence on the thinking behind the Constitution than on the thinking that justified the American Revolution. Broad Calvinist principles do lie in the background to the Constitution, but so also do other strains of ideology as well as American reactions to the particular circumstances of the British 
imperial system. Madison's view of factions, confidence in human capacities balanced by recognizing human corruptibility, probably did owe something to Witherspoon and historical Calvinism. Excellent historians, however, have also shown that Madison's thinking came from many sources and from his practical experience in defending religious and political leaders in Virginia. And moreover, Witherspoon's teaching at Princeton contained a thorough mishmash, that's the technical word, of traditional Calvinism, along with a great deal of David Hume, Francis Hutcheson, and other modern figures. Yet the con Constitution, not a pure democracy, but a representative republic, is in fact similar to Presbyterian ecclesiology, where congregations elect elders, but where the elders conduct the business of the church. It may be a pertinent observation, however, that Presbyterian government does not separate executive, judicial, and legislative functions as the Constitution does. In the absence of direct evidence that the key constitutional figures relied expressly on Reformed or Presbyterian principles, and even with what is known about James Madison training under John Witherspoon, the safest judgment in answer to the question about Presbyterians in the Constitution is to say that connection is stronger than not proven, but something less than what the lawyers would call entirely dispositive. So a real connection, but don't get too excited about it. <laughs> okay, number four, what about Presbyterians and slavery? I think I'll have just a sip of water here. For obvious reasons, our nation is now fixated on how American institutions and individuals who lived in the years before the Civil War engaged with the na national system of black-only chattel slavery. It's no different for Presbyterians, and especially for John Witherspoon because of his prominence in the early history of Princeton University. I can be brief in treating this question because an expertly researched discussion of Witherspoon as a slave holder has recently been published as a special issue of Princeton Seminary's journal, Theology Today, and because Princeton University earlier this month released a committee report that carefully considered what to do with the Witherspoon statue that stands at the center of the university's campus. And there's a, a, a depiction of that statue on the first page of the uh, handout. In the Revolutionary Era, Presbyterians, when compared with the general population, were slightly more attuned to the plight of Africans and enslaved Africans and somewhat readier to attack the slave system. Early American denunciations of slavery came almost all from Quakers, but one of the first non-Quaker condemnations of the system on biblical and more, more, more moral reasons was published in 1772 by Benjamin Rush during his time when he was closely associated with Presbyterians. During the war itself, Jacob Green of Morristown, New Jersey, was one of several ministers who condemned slave holding by patriots, and this is quoting now, who so loudly complain of Britain's attempts to oppress and enslave us. Green also predicted with uncanny accuracy, however we may be free from British oppression, we shall have inward convulsions, contentions, oppressions, and various calamities so that our liberty will be uncomfortable till we wash our hands from the guilt of Negro slavery. In 1787, the Senate of New York and New Jersey, the Presbyterian's highest judiciary before the establishment of the General Assembly, cautiously but straightforwardly urged every member of their body and all the churches and families under their care to promote the abolition of slavery and the instruction of Negroes, whether bond or free. A few years later, David Rice, a revival-friendly educator who helped found Hampton Sydney College in Virginia and Transylvania University in Kentucky, presented a full array of theological, biblical, and political arguments in, unfortunately, a failed effort to have slavery outlawed in Kentucky's new state constitution. Yet alongside Presbyterians who appealed for the end of slavery, 
Other Presbyterians defended the system on economic, social, and biblical grounds. In the 1790s, William Graham, president of Liberty Hall, later Washington and Lee University in Virginia, used his lectures on moral philosophy to provide students a full-scale rebuttal, a rebuttal of arguments that use scripture to attack the system. And then there's a complicated case of John Witherspoon. In his career as a minister in Scotland and an educator in America, Witherspoon went out of his way on several occasions to baptize, educate, and encourage Christians of African descent. He also supported the Synod's 1787 statement. During his post-war service in the New Jersey legislature, he cited in a dispute between abolitionists and slave owners with the abolitionists. And in his own moral philosophy lectures to Princeton students, his judgment was cautious but clear. He wrote or, pre, uh, or lectured, I do not think there lies any necessity on those who found men in a state of slavery to make them free to their own ruin, but it is very doubtful whether any original cause of servitude can be defended except legal punishment for the commission of crimes. Yet when Witherspoon moved out to his country estate to school him, tax records from the years 1780 to 1786 show that he owned one or two slaves. In addition, after the death of his wife Elizabeth, Witherspoon married the much younger uh, Anne Dill, who brought two slaves with her into the marriage, although those enslaved individuals may have been set on a course toward manumission. So, was Witherspoon a hypocrite who said one thing or did another? Was he conforming to the conventional acceptance of slavery as a temporary expedient? Or was he only caught up in the rapid tide of events without the leisure to perfectly align his actions with his opinions. As it happens, the ambiguity and caution of Presbyterians in the Revolutionary Era forecast the divided mind of the church in the generations that followed. Serious historians agree that some of the most powerful Christian arguments against slavery came from the Presbyterians. And this really is, a, uh, in, in today's terms, a, 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 a hall of honor. Alexander McLeod, George Bourne, Albert Barnes, and the African-American James W.C. Pennington. But they also agree that Presbyterians like James Henry Thornwell, Robert Dabney, and Benjamin Palmer made the strongest attempts to show that scripture allowed slavery, while still other Presbyterians like Charles Hodge and Robert Breckinridge tried to set out a middle position describing slavery as an evil but hesitating to demand immediate abolition. The report of the Princeton University Committee charged with considering the statue of Witherspoon began its recommendation with a discriminating premise. John Witherspoon, it concluded, is worthy of recognition, but not canonization. My own conclusion about Witherspoon, and in indeed in general about American Presbyterians of this era, is almost the same. I would say that they deserve not only respect but admiration, yet not uncritical exoneration. Behind this judgment lies the Reformed theology that the revolutionary generation of Presbyterians did so much to preserve. That theology begins with the awareness that everyone, everyone, even the most admirable individuals, are still only fallen sinners in need of God's saving grace. It would take another entire lecture to explore the bearing of the present of the history I have outlined to, uh, for our world today. But I think a few things can be said briefly. Perhaps most important is the realization that history is usually complex for important events like the founding of the United States and concerning important leaders like the leading Presbyterians of the Revolutionary Era. Hence, when trying to learn from the past, it is usually wise to try to say several things than offering a simple one-dimensional lesson when trying to put those lessons to, into practice. In this case, Presbyterian history provides a clear warning about the dangers of runaway hyperbole, 
So in a sermon delivered to the Presbyterians of Newburyport, Massachusetts in October 1777, Abraham Catultus trumpeted that the war for independence was the cause of truth against falsehood, the cause of pure and undefiled religion against bigotry, superstition, and human in invention. In short, it is a cause of heaven against hell, of the kind parent of the universe against the prince of darkness and the destroyer of the human race. Such declamations made it impossible both to see the humanity of the patriots' foes and to recognize the evils that lingered amongst the patriots themselves. Not the least of those evils was the toleration of actual enslavement when the revolutionaries were so apocalyptic in decrying enslavement from Parliament. John Witherspoon's otherwise honorable course in the war was also tarnished by another example of such hypocrisy. As part of his service in Congress, Witherspoon ghost wrote recantations for two printers, Benjamin Town of Philadelphia and James Rivington of New York, who had fallen, fallen afoul of Congress for publishing work supporting the Loyalists. Witherspoon's recantations did illustrate his gift for satire, but they also showed how quickly the defenders of liberty could move to silence those who used their own liberty to oppose the patriot cause. Thankfully, Witherspoon and his life provide many examples of wisdom that is just as timely for our own tumultuous day as it was for his. And so I close with this strikingly reformed reminder about the need for perspective concerning all things political. It comes from Witherspoon's justly renowned fast day sermon on the wisdom of providence over the passions of men. He preached, I do not blame your ardor in preparing for your resolute defense of your temporal rights, but consider, I beseech you, the truly infinite importance of the salvation of your souls. Have you assembled together willingly to what shall be said on public affairs and to join in imploring the blessing of God on the councils and arms of the United Councils Colonies? And can you be unconcerned what shall become of you forever when all the monuments of human greatness shall be laid in ashes for the earth itself and all the works that are in there shall be burnt up. Thank you. I thought, I mean, Mark, I'd start by asking you, um, you've given us this wonderfully, you know, judicious, careful history of, of Presbyterians in this revolutionary era. And I mean, in some sense, I think one of the main themes of the talk, in some sense, is to be judicious and careful in the way that we tell stories about the past. Um, you know, and it's also true we're coming up on the semi-quincentennial of the revolution, and we sit at a moment when, I mean, I just saw it in the New York Times today, more than three quarters of the nation thinks that democracy is endangered. And I wonder, as you, I guess I want to ask you one question about the past, and, and as you reflect back on this era that you've just given us this judicious kind of account of, what do you, at the end of the day, make of the revolution itself, and and of this? You know, it's obviously it's a world historical event. Right, it's right, a, it's right. such an important you know event in the history, not just of the United States, but but of the world uh, more broadly. And we're coming up on this historic anniversary right. of it. What should we think about it? I mean, is it something that we should be? I mean, I think we're preparing for celebration. And and, and how should? What's the spirit or tone? with which we should be remembering this event 250 years later? Well, I'm actually uh, old enough to have been asked that question 50 years ago, or mm. 48 years ago now. And uh, I, I am beginning to develop an answer then. I think I've developed it even further now. Gazed from the perspective of 2024 mm -hmm. and trying to understand more broadly what was happening in the world at the time, I'm not sure I can see any uh, overwhelming justification for the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. 
They are the reasons that uh, John Wesley in England, for example, said, how, ca how can there be a group complaining about the yip yipping, yipping about the enslavement of parliament by people who enslave other human beings? By the same token, um, William Smith, whom I uh, quoted, moved to Canada and helped establish a system of law and respect for human rights in a system where it developed by evolution rather than revolution. So although there are clearly legitimate, uh, or there's, yes, clearly legitimate complaints about how uh, Parliament was managing the colonies, in, in John Calvin's estimation, had they become hyper-oppressive and thoroughly vicious, and my answer from the angle now is no. But I've also thought that uh, understanding a little bit, even a little bit of how, of what conventions were in the 18th century, I'm sure that if I had been a believer, a member of George Duffield's church in, in uh, 1774, 1776, I, I would have been part of the revolution because it would have, there would have been so many things to be taken for granted. Yes, I know, we, have, we enslave human beings, but we're working on that. We're, we're making improvement. But don't you understand that the, that the parliament just seems to be aiming at taking away everything? So they, they, they have taken away the right to tax without our uh, say anything. When, when the Boston people, they acted rashly at dumping that tea in the harbor. We in Philadelphia peacefully protested when the ships with tea came in and we had a peaceful resolution. The ships went back with their tea. It was rash in Boston, but it was even rasher of the parliament to end colonial self-rule in Massachusetts and send troops that fired on citizens and killed them. Mm. Well, you know, I don't do much social media, but I, I've heard that it's really persuasive. <laughs> and the, 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 the equivalent of social media where people like this Abraham Cateltis that I quoted who, who was inflammatory. Mm. And I would say complaining about legitimate grievances but not on the order to justify a revolution mm -hmm. against what was imperfect, partially corrupt, but still, um, in terms of the world and in terms of what was possible in the 1770s, not a terrible, not a despotic, not a hopelessly corrupt system. So, mm -hmm. like a good academic, I can't give you a straight answer, but. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, 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 between and I do, th but I do think that the now and the then mm. is actually really. I mean, it has to do with the, the attitude towards statues and things too. You say, well, what we know now, we have to take into account, mm. and we have to be alert to the desires and needs of a present-day population. But we also have to try to imagine what it was like for the people being honored and then for the people who put up the, mm. put up the statues. I mean, it seems like some of the historians I know who have wanted to operate in a more celebratory register, and sometimes I think because they think nations need stories to celebrate yeah. about themselves, um, have wanted to say that whatever the particulars, if we were to go back and adjudicate whether it was really rightful, yeah. um, that it, it nevertheless amplified you know, Jill Lepore's book, These yeah. Truths. It amplified certain values or truths yeah. that um, have, you know, not been uncomplicatedly lived out in the history of this country or the world, but that it gave them so, some sort of platform or... or yeah. yeah, I, I think that, that's actually a, a very shrewd observation and it often derives from a, an understanding of how over the course of time, democratic ideals evolved hmm. and at, at least for a long time evolved in a positive direction. So we have, um, I, I think the, the great example in US history is Abraham Lincoln, who felt that the ideals of the Declaration had influenced the Constitution, but that that influencing needed to continue. And I think that, that's, that's a, a, a really, um, 
that's a legitimate claim, and I think it's one that um, Christian people, theists of any kind, can, can go along with, because in, in Lincoln's mind, there was a, there was a, a transcendent reason for believing that all men, all people, are, are created equal. I do wonder, however, today, about that line of argument concerning the rise of democratic government, because today, I think it would be difficult in the United States to have a commonly agreed upon rationale or reason for supporting um, the equality of all people, democratic government. If, if there isn't some enlightenment commitment to rational humanity, if there's not some kind of theistic or even deistic belief that Mm. There's, a, there's a power or a spirit or a force mm. in the universe that pushes us in this direction. If those beliefs are given up, yeah. if, if, if we're completely postmodern in our understanding of ideology as power, mm. and if we disregard the possibility of a theistic framework, a deistic, a God-oriented a God framework for mm. public life, then why, why should we believe that democracy mm. won't just run off the, the, the uh, rails? Hitler by the, was elected. The, mm. the, uh, Chancellor of Germany. Yeah. So, I, you know, historians are pessimists, but at least one day or two days a week, I'd like to think that mm. there's somehow a, a mixture of positive humanistic values mm. and positive Christian values that have actually cooperated mm. in the history of the United States, not always, uh, always imper imperfectly, but mm. with, with individuals like uh, Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. with John Harlan in his descent to the Plessy versus mm -hmm. Ferguson decision in 1893, mm -hmm. uh, to Woodrow Wilson's speeches, I'm not so sure about Woodrow Wilson's actions, mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, Barack Obama and mm -hmm. standing before the congregation in Charleston and singing Amazing mm -hmm. Grace because Charles Pinckney, mm -hmm. the pastor, mm -hmm. had operated with grace mm -hmm. toward the people who, who tried mm -hmm. to oppress. So in that sense, mm -hmm. you do have a what could be considered a, a hopeful history, mm. but then the other five days a week, mm. mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not so sure. Let me ask one more question and then we'll open it up. Um, you know, one of the things that strikes me, and I, I imagine you've had plenty of occasion to reflect on this in the course of your career. I mean, again, this is such a judicious account of Christian engagement around this important uh, moment. There's so many books that have sold millions of copies that have been not judicious <laughs> and that have given a, a you know, and, and obviously in recent years, the kind of revival of an idea of America as a Christian nation to, to be understood in a kind of particular exceptionalist yeah, vein. Right. Um, that has such widespread appeal. Often there's kind of proof texting of historical quotations that are taken out of context and used to make an argument. Um, you know, in a spirit very different from the talk that we've heard you give this afternoon. And I wonder, as somebody who's been a lifelong, you know, Christian and historian doing this kind of careful work, if you have an exhortation to those of us who are here around, how do you cultivate, practice this kind of careful thinking in a society that is readily, you know, I don't know, susceptible to, um, we swim in these other kinds of not careful narratives. And I think social media has certainly made this maybe worse, but it, it predates social media. I mean, the kinds right, of- Right, 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 right. I don't know, so I just don't know if you have any reflections on this or any thoughts, any things that you've noticed in communities that have um, been able to sustain a more complex view of the past. Well, the facetious answer, of course, is to buy my books. Come on, people. Uh, Marcus sold his tens and X, Y, and Z has sold their millions. Yeah. Uh, a serious answer, I think, uh, and particularly can be said in a Christian church, is, that, um, is, is to follow the um, kind of admonition that Witherspoon, that I quoted at the end, end of the talk. Uh, of course, people should be involved in the, in the give and take and the the loyalties and the critiques of their own day, but, but, but certainly Christian theology reminds us that, that uh, we are citizens of this world and at the same time we're pilgrims. Mm. And there is a higher, 
there, there's a deeper citizenship that all Christian believers have that would, that would make, I, th I would almost say, all of our political commitments relatively relative. Mm. And some of them are going to be very close to our hearts. But if we, if we think that um, the Christian message is true, and, and it, 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 it coming in several varieties, but certainly in the Reformed tradition, what is the source of, the, of each human being made in the image of God? What, what, is this, what is the source of human problems? Individuals themselves turning away from God and not just the other guy turning away from God. And then in, in the world in which we live today for Christian believers, we have to think that uh, the, 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 the believers in the United States are a woeful minority in, in the world Christian scene. If, if you're a um, believer in China, do you, do you want to, uh, you know, you want to appeal to the Chinese government to support your church? I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Believers throughout much of the rest of the world just don't have the American possibilities of the, of the American problem. And, and that awareness is also part of what, if you say the Apostles' Creed, you believe in the, mm -hmm. the communion of saints. And the communion of saints includes a lot of people who don't have the advantages or the problems mm -hmm. of American society. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, buy some good books <laughs> that, that you have to take a while to read and <coughs> can't put on your <laughs> social media account. But even more, uh, think about what the Christian faith means mm -hmm. and realize that uh, all of our allegiances, except one, have to be at least a little bit held in hmm. tension. Yeah. Um, I'd like to open it up. If you could come to the center mic and please uh, just say your name and if you can keep your question brief. Um, <laughs> that would well, be. I'll make it be brief, great. but there are three. Okay. I'm Mary Frances Davis, and I'm a member of this congregation. Um, comment, the Quakers believed in peace, but they owned and sold and bought slaves. Some, and there was a, slave, a Quaker slave market down near the river here. Um, the questions are about um, George Whitfield or Whitefield <clears throat> and um, what he, his talks around here were around 1730s what um, you may want to say about him. Maybe he was too early. <clears throat> and the final one is about Archibald Alexander. Now I understand he may have come later, and that's <clears throat> why you didn't bring him up. But he was um, in, he had his great awakening experience on his way across the Blue Ridge Mountains to my mother's church, uh, Monmouth in um, Virginia. He then came to this church for 1806 to 1811, and then he went to be the founding right, right. president of Princeton right. Theological Seminary. So what you would say on those two? Well, uh, the, the Quakers, I think, is, is a good uh, question, in particular Philadelphians, because as you say, there were Quakers who uh, profited from the slave trade. But then it's also important to say that, that, that uh, with just one or two exceptions, if there was going to be a Christian voice against slavery before the year 1770 in the Western world, it came from Quakers. So people like uh, Anthony Benizet and John Woolman really just deserve a lot of attention and respect, even realizing that because they were Quakers, they were considered to be fringy people that you didn't have to pay any attention to. George Whitfield is interesting. He uh, uh, was talking with a friend who's retired from the uh, University of Pennsylvania History Department and about the recent debates at Penn on statues. And he said, well, of course, the Whitfield statue is gone because uh, although in his early uh, revival preaching, he did condemn slave owners for mistreatment of slaves. After he established his orphanage in uh, Georgia, Bethesda, 
he employed he employed slave masters and bought sla uh, and used tried to use slaves and then was very much responsible for the changing the original Georgia charter that had uh, ruled slavery out. Okay, so Whitfield's statue is gone because he tolerated slavery. But then, you know, history is, is uh, complicated. I one time tried to read uh, everything written by, everything published by African Americans or African Britons before 1780. And actually, you can do that in, in a few hours. There's just not very much. Almost all of the memoirs that were beginning to publish in the uh, mid to late 1770s on the 1780s by believing Christian African Americans refer fondly to George Whitfield as an influence in their coming to faith. So the poem, for example, that Phyllis Wheatley published in 1770 on the death of Whitfield, which actually made her famous and allowed her to go to England and be sponsored by the Countess of Huntington, says nothing about Whitfield's sponsorship of enslavement, but spends time praising him because he preached to African Americans as if they were humans who could accept the gospel and Christ's work on their behalf. So in modern terms, uh, Whitfield's just a simple hypocrite who uh, you know, preached liberation in Christ, but then pushed Georgia to allow for enslavement because he needed to break it even on his, his orphanage. And he was a leading voice in his day saying black people are worthy of the gospel and need to receive it. Alexander, uh, I'm, I actually know a fair bit about Alexander and how he talked about religious epistemology <laughs> and how he used the Scottish common sense philosophy as a basis for believing in the Bible. But I'm afraid I don't know too much about where he stood on some of these controversies, except that he was from Virginia and was quite, uh, had, had friends that would have been uh, associates with the slave owning class. I, I kind of suspect that uh, Charles Hodges' later position might have come from Alexander. And that, that position was complicated. Hodge did not think it was wise to have immediate abolition of slavery, but he did think that the slave system was filled with evils that would eventually bring it down. And I'm suspecting that that might have been Alexander's position because Hodge was so much indebted to Alexander for so many of his positions. The you could, Presbyterian Historical Society right behind us right. um, has a book of his. Yeah, I'm sure they've got a lot of books of his. Because he wrote. Oh, I have a particular one. Yeah, good. That good. he wrote that was uh, Psalms and mm. hymns and things like that. Mm. Yeah. 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 Didn't, they were ones that didn't get into the um, first authorized right. You'd find, uh, if you're interested in Archibald Alexander in particular, he'll, there, he'll be discussed in the Princeton Seminary's audit on its historical relationship to right. slavery because he was one of our first professors. Um, and there, there's a, I don't want to, try to recollect that off the top of my head right now because I'll, I'll get it wrong. But I know he's discussed there because he's an important figure at PTS as well. Other questions? I invite you to come forward. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you, Mark, for your lecture. I'm Brian Shetler, and I work at, at PTS, actually, with Heath. So uh, if, you, if you search slavery audit in Princeton Seminary, you will find that, uh, the report that Heath was mentioning. Uh, just a quick question about uh, sort of British perspective. About? So uh, about British perspectives, yeah. and particularly the sort of Presbyterian church in, in Britain and in Scotland and what their perspective was on the colonies right. and was their support for the revolution, right. even if underground. Um, I know that there was quite a lot of influence from people like John Wilkes, who sort of spurred, right. 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 you know, for, for liberty and, and um, was influential to Franklin and others, but particularly the Presbyterian movement and how much they right. could or could not show support for the colonies at right. the time. Well, the, the, the mention of John Wilkes is really interesting because he, he was uh, a true radical in the, uh, in, in the he was, uh, I think in London, elected to parliament, but he was also known as, as a, a, a publisher of uh, commendation for the, uh, uh, the, 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 the 1745 effort to remove the king. So he's known as a real radical. And he, he's disallowed his 
a seat in Parliament, there's another election, he's elected again, he's disallowed. When Witherspoon writes the letter that I mentioned about to his Scottish immigrants in America, he went out of his way to say, my defense of resistance is completely different from John Wilkes. So he wanted to disassociate himself from Wilkes. Wilkes is known as a free thinker, a deist at best. And Witherspoon says, I, I want my defense of, of a, a, a proper war for independence to have nothing to do with that kind. Uh, the story in, in uh, Britain is complicated. In, in Scotland, the members of what's sometimes called the Popular Party or sometimes known as the Evangelical Party w were uh, amenable to supporting the revolution. John Erskine, who was a great uh, correspondent with all sorts of people, uh, started with Jonathan Edwards and right up into the 19th century, actually published a couple of tracts favorable to the, to the cause. That would have been not um, a universal view, but, but uh, a common. And then in Britain, uh, the, the dissenting churches, the non-Anglican churches, had significant support for the uh, American cause, as well as significant resistance. Uh, there's two really good books by a, a historian who's retired from Fuller Seminary. And I want you young people never to get old, because you forget stuff you know you know but that had a real uh, extensive documentation of how much that dissent, it really was dissent. It wasn't taken too seriously because in Britain, the dissenters were still marginally outside of the political system. In order to be a member of parliament, you had to be an occasional conformist. Once a year, you had to take communion at an Anglican church or you, or you couldn't serve in parliament. So they, they were, and, and Witherspoon was writing as much to them as he was to the Scottish immigrants in, in the country, and, and it had an effect. Hmm. Great. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, Mark, thank you. And I'm old enough to have been in this congregation and an elder in 89 when the um, Constitution had just been ratified yeah. 200 yeah. years ago, yeah. Yeah. and the General Assembly met here. here so Old Pine hosted <laughs> churches from all over yeah. America, mm -hmm. and with Wheaton College, mm -hmm. an exhibition on art that was juried from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did certainly see, and I chaired the Constitutional Bicentennial mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. the 87 period, actually 80. Right. One to 91 almost, but I certainly saw mm. the influence back and forth of the Constitution and the Presbyterian Church um, right. f structure. The one thing they missed in the convention was that when George Mason on the 12th of September proposed a Bill of Rights, proposed. everybody wanted to go home. Bill of Rights. It was time to bring in the crops. They left and they didn't put them in. Mm. Finally, Madison proposed an amendment to Congress and they began to consider rights. What do you think, now that we are arguing over so many rights, mm. rights not just right. uh, for freedom too, right. but rights to this and to that. What do you think either the church yeah. or the philosophies yeah. of the founders would say about this? Mm. That is a very interesting question and uh, I'm gonna to try to say something, but if, if, if you really know that history from 1787 to 1791, you know that's a complicated story. And I'm correct in thinking, aren't I, that Madison did not want originally a Bill of Rights because he felt that once you specified some things, then it left ambiguous about other things. Um, I, I will say, and, and correct me now if I'm wrong on this memory, um, one of the reasons why people like, will, will take the kind of stance I've had, I've told you about today, definite connections between the Presbyterian history and the Constitution, mm. but also considerable ambiguity mm. is because of the question of prayer as the Constitutional Convention. Now, some of the historians that uh, Heath was mentioning earlier have sold a lot of books mm. and whom I'm very envious of every time I get my two-figure royalty check <laughs> for the books I've written. 
have made a big deal that prayer was proposed at the Constitutional Convention. But they don't go on to say that the, that the uh, proposal was tabled and there was no prayer. And it's fairly well documented, and this it sounds like myth, but it's also fairly well documented, that when Alexander Hamilton, who in the latter part of his life really did become a serious <clears throat> Christian person of a reformed caste, I'm not exactly sure, was asked, well, why didn't you pray? You prayed every session of the Continental Congress, and I, I think George Duffield may actually have prayed the initial, but there were different people who prayed. Why didn't you pray at the Council Convention? And he said, we forgot. <laughs> so it was Benjamin Franklin who actually proposed the prayer. But now on the question of rights, I do think the First Amendment to the Constitution was a stroke of genius for two reasons. One was um, to bring the colonies, the states together. So and when the Constitution is passed, there's 14 states by that time, Vermont's a state, 12 of them have some preference for Christian faith. And in, in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Connecticut, tax money is collected for the congregational churches. In Rhode Island, there's no church establishment, and, and Virginia has there's passed the uh, Jefferson and Madison Amendment. But those are the only two states that have not, uh, the uh, Pennsylvania had a, a, a provision in, in its original constitution that limited either, either civic participation or holding office to people who believed in the New Testament. Hmm. And the Jewish uh, rabbis in Philadelphia came to Pennsylvania and said, look, we, we sent our sons to fight we committed, why can't we take part? And, and they changed it. Um, in the Carolinas, I think you had to uh, believe in the Trinity. In Maryland, you had to just believe in God because they didn't want to mess around with the Protestant and Catholic. But there were, so uh, well, one way, it was just a, the First Amendment was a, a religion separation, was just a, a way of getting along. But I think there was also a strand of real, both, humanitarian and Christian conviction. And, and this, this is one place where Madison's influence from Witherspoon may be found. He wrote a list of reasons why he, he would, in Virginia, support the, 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 the resolution separating church and state. And in that resolution were some Christian reasons. If you're going to enshrine a Protestant faith with a, or an, interpretation of the Bible, what about people who interpret the Bible differently? Hmm. Uh, if you're going to have one Christian denomination, what about fair treatment of other Christians? He, so he was partly reasoning not from humanitarian grounds, but from uh, religious grounds. Now, I, th I do think uh, the, the, the people who were most in favor of a first of the Bill of Rights were those who were most impressed with the real Whig arguments I was trying to explain because they feared that the concentration of power in central government would lead to corruption and, and tyranny. So like I think a lot of things in American history, there's a, there's a complicated, confusing rationale in which there's pragmatic, principled, and then selfish reasons behind, behind what we have. And you know, I don't know if there's any judges here or people in the appellate courts who have to ha hash through these things. They're, they, they're, they're the source of endless debate, much of which is reasonable, and uh, it just requires the wisdom of Solomon. Mm. But with, uh, I would say, with, with a real good beginning point. Mm. So I, I talked favorably about Canada earlier. But the Canadians actually don't have the kind of protection the Americans have because they don't have, they actually have in the new constitution a, a kind of bill of rights, but it's nothing as stable and as solid and as ancient as what we have in seven, from 1791. Mm. Uh, 
I think we should end, and then uh, we're going to have a reception downstairs, and, and Dr. Noel will be available. Um, thank you, speaking of wisdom, for sharing so much of yours with us today, Mark. Um, and thank you again. I hope you, you noticed on the back of your program the, the, the sponsors and organizations. This has been a group project from the beginning. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to uh, those who support this financially and those who, uh, uh, you know, Old Pine and uh, PHS and all those who, who brought um, this together. Thank you I mean, so much. Since this is America where it pays to advertise, be sure to look at the, the book that uh, Dave Robinson had pulled together from his grandfather, which is filled with information about the Philadelphia churches in 1774 and how they responded in, in the com coming of the Continental Congress. And copies of that will be on sale at the reception. Um, you can get Dr. Knowles' books online, obviously. Uh, and we hope you'll join us downstairs for that. Thank you again.